Hi. Um, I'm actually meant to have my colleague Kirsten Sherling join me today, um, but she is um, in Calais at the moment. And thanks very much. And, um, and so she can't be here. You might know that Calais was going to be demolished yesterday, um, but that demolition's now been put back to the beginning of November. But she has sent me a little message that I just wanted to start by reading out to you. She says, I'm so sorry not to be with you all today. To be in a room with such incredible people would be a real gift. Instead, I've had to stay in Calais to help with the final week before the entire camp is demolished. It's so difficult to put the jungle into words, a tangled, complicated, and multi-layered beast, inside of which complex, traumatized, and uncertain individuals try desperately to work out what the next best step is. There is more to life than merely existing, has never felt more true than here. Life is always on the line here, chaos is everywhere, while political forces argue behind seemingly closed doors over 15 different nations, multiple religions and almost countless languages come together in a makeshift camp built on a rubbish dump. A shared sense of humanity only just manages to hold it all together. Today, as we meet, we meet, we will be assisting 72 shop and restaurant owners to clear out their place of community. Eviction notices were served on Tuesday, and we expect the authorities to dismantle them at 2 p.m. Thursday. As the jungle is destroyed, I will mourn its loss, despite it being such a despicable place. Is it strange to mourn something you don't believe should ever have existed at all? Um, just to start by briefly introducing myself, so I'm an international theatre producer and I work freelance and um, in January I went out to Calais to volunteer for a week and I ended up going backwards and forwards over the next six months. Um, I went to volunteer with an organisation called Good Chance Theatre and um, my job really with Good Chance was to produce a festival in London that happened last July, August, and that festival was called Encampment at the South Bank Centre. Um, I'm just going to... There we go. So here's, I'm going to go through some pictures of the camp and just give you, a, give you an overview of what life in the camp is like. So when Kirsten and I first went to the camp, we found it to be a place of vast contradictions. While it looks and feels deeply depressing, it also holds a largely positive atmosphere. The foundations of community are there in the restaurants and shops and the willingness and need of residents and volunteers alike to set up community spaces and give some kind of resemblance of order in the, in the chaos of an unofficial camp. The very best of humanity sits side by side with the very worst. You can see the kind of living conditions in the slides behind me. The residents faced huge obstacles each day, often with unfathomable resilience and dignity. It's been raining for the last three days in Calais, so this is some of the recent flooding that people are having to contend with. These obstacles include finding food, water, shelter, clothing. They also include near normalized police brutality in the form of beatings, tear gas, and rubber bullets. Fascist groups often gather on the outskirts of the camp to protect its existence, to, sorry, to protest its existence and the people in it. Tensions between local Calais residents and jungle residents are fraught. Conflicts between various individuals and groups living in the jungle can play out through violent confrontations. Fires have regularly broken out, and in recent months, there's not been enough food to feed the 10,000 plus people living there. This number also includes over 1,000 unaccompanied minors. And of those 1,000 unaccompanied minors, there are over 300 unaccompanied minors who have family in the UK and therefore have a legal right to safe passage and reunification. So while finding that Calais was a place where barriers between people were at their most powerful, I saw they were also at their most obsolete. The theatre space that was created there by Good Chance was an example of this. It was a space in which people met each other and connected with each other despite language barriers, race, religion, ability or disability, trauma, some having more or less than others. It was a positive, powerful, and inspiring place in the middle of one of the most awful places in the Western world. Good Chance Theatre set up this geodesic dome in the heart of the Calais jungle camp, and it was built last September 2015. We had to take it down in March of this year because the southern section of the camp in which the tent was built was demolished. We then spent about five or six months negotiating with the French government to 
go back out to Calais and rebuild in a French government-owned piece of land called the Jules Ferry Centre. Um, after about six months of negotiations, but it was pretty much all signed off, uh, Francoise Hollande visited the camp and uh, said that we, we wouldn't be able to go back. So at the moment, the Good Chance Dome isn't there. Um, to take you on a sort of one day in the life of the Good Chance Theatre in Calais, uh, the day would start at about 12 o'clock, and it started so late because when people are jumping on lorries every night trying to get back to the UK, um, often they, they won't wake up before midday. So we started off the day with warm-up and exercise, stretching out people's bodies, warming them up for a day of painting, storytelling, physical theatre and games, as well as concerts, open mic nights and film screenings in the evenings. Artists and companies from the UK and from around the world would come and run workshops with the residents of the camp. And it was interesting to see how they responded to some of the challenges that we faced running that space in the camp. And I just want to talk through some of the challenges um, that we had, to, we had to overcome when we were there. So, no long-term projects. One of the realities of the camp was that the people you'd built up a good relationship with would suddenly disappear. You'd never see them again. You'd hope that they'd be in a better place, that they'd maybe got to the UK. But it meant that long-term projects of even a week long were almost impossible and very difficult to achieve. Projects had to be short, engaging, and beneficial in practical terms. So it meant that things like games that might not be given such importance in the UK were really, really great at bringing people together. One of the other challenges was the limited language. Any day in the camp, you would hear so many languages. You'd hear Pashto, Farsi, Tigrinya, Arabic, Amharic, Dari, Urdu, all sorts. And we were often handing out translation sheets when there were performances in English going on, which wasn't very often. But usually what it meant that the workshops that happened in that space had to be physical, and they had to connect with people um, on a much more physical basis and get people to do more abstract work together. One of the other challenges was short attention spans. Now, trauma manifests itself in many ways, and one of the ways we found it manifested itself in the camp was with short attention spans. And this was really interesting watching some very well-known and very, very um, praised and lauded artists from the UK coming over and people just leaving the room because they're bored, because they can't understand what they're saying. Um, and I thought that was, that was quite good. Um, it meant that any activities that involved sitting down and listening for long periods would be difficult to catch on. The best workshops got everyone, got, got everyone on their feet and engaging in a task. Accessibility for all was a, was a problem for us. The majority of people in the Calais camp are young men. And um, in an environment with that many young men and that much um, physical energy, it can be quite difficult to make it a space where women and children feel safe. So it would have meant shutting the dome to the young men in order to make it accessible for women and children. And it was something that we never quite managed to do. What I think was a real strength of the Good Chance Dome was that the residents of the camp really felt ownership of that space. So if we shut it and, wouldn't, and couldn't explain really why, people would get really angry and we'd have a confrontation. So we kept it open and we just tried to make it as open and as friendly for everyone as we could. And the last one is the temporary nature of the volunteer positions. Um, the volunteers in the camp would come out for um, to come out and help and support the space that uh, we created. And what we found is that people were coming out for a weekend, basically whenever they had time to come. And a weekend is not enough time. You know, it's not helpful when you've got a British passport in your back pocket to come out and smile and bring lots of energy and make lots of friendships and then leave. Um, we actually found that really detrimental and actually quite damaging. So we said to people that they had to come out for a minimum of a week, preferably longer. Um, and that really meant that we had some sort of system in place that the residents knew that people would come and they would go, but um, it, it was easier to communicate that to them. But despite all of the difficulties of the above, the main ethical question that I struggled with every day, and which was often asked of us more than once, is why use up space enough for 10 tents, a generator, wooden flooring, and other critical items for a theater? Why spend time and effort on games and workshops and cultural activities when new arrivals into the camp were struggling for adequate food, shelter, and clothing? So you'll probably all be familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs pyramid of human motivation. 
Um, the lower three levels are equated to survival needs. And so this table shows that actually what people need to survive after their, after their basic needs, their safety and physiological needs are met, is a community. My friend John Martin, who's the director of an amazing company called Pan Intercultural Arts, who's worked in this field for many years, says that of all the conflict zones and poverty-stricken slums he's been to over his career, the Calais Jungle Refugee Camp was one of the worst places he'd ever visited. <coughs> the reason for this is because even in the darkest poverty and conflict, the strength of community and belonging helps people survive. In Calais, everyone has left their communities. Most are without friends or family, and they've also not yet reached their destinations. So it's hard for them to community build in a space that they have no intention of staying beyond tomorrow. Some have been in the camp for months, and the psychological effect of this can be really damaging. The debate about emergency response versus long-term development planning is a subject that comes up regularly in humanitarian fields. Recently, the UN Secretary General released a report which stated that we should tear down divisions between humanitarian work that delivers aid and development work which strives to end need. He proposed merging the two. There are, of course, arguments for and against this, but I think it can be said that the community spaces that started appearing in the jungle, of which Good Chance Theatre was one, helped fill the gap between them. The aptly named Jungle Books, a library that offers books, fiction, non-fiction, and educational in many languages. The gym, a recent addition to the camp where people can get active, learn kung fu, karate, and boxing. The refugee info bus, which is where my colleague Kirsten is working at the moment, is a converted horse box that acts as a solar-powered office, which drives on and off-site every day and provides free Wi-Fi access to up to 150 people at a time. These spaces sit neatly alongside the emergency response within the camp of food, water, shelter, and access to medical care, and all are essential to the well-being of those in the camp. The Good Chance Dome offered a place that people could dance or sit quietly, they could sing, paint, work, and crucially, play. The theatre became a place of sanctuary. It was the only place in the jungle that the residents didn't have to ask for anything. When they entered the dome, they were someone with a character and personality, and people knew them by. They weren't a faceless number having to ask and receive charity and aid, one of many in need. They were, in short, themselves. As my friend, as my friend Hussein told me, the dome was as important to me as if it was my grandmother's house. I would have defended it with my life. Although we didn't set out to achieve a therapeutic space, because we are artists, not therapists, the space began to unconsciously deal with the long-term effects of living in a place like the jungle. The residents' contribution and participation every day made the Good Chance Dome what it was, and they knew it. And that was emboldening and empowering, even for those who weren't particularly artistically inclined. Without their energy and enthusiasm, it would have been empty, and this empowered them and motivated them to contribute. In my opinion, that is theatre and space being used to the absolute optimum. Kirsten told me that one morning a young Eritrean man approached the dome and asked her, what is this? And she told him it was a theatre. He turned out to be a circus performer. Can I teach circus here, he asked. That afternoon, after a mad scramble to find hula hoops and juggling clubs, we had a dome filled with at least ten different nationalities, speaking multiple languages, learning to juggle and hula hoop. Our Eritrean friend stayed teaching every day for a month before he finally moved on from Calais. We also had another situation where we had a catwalk of bad donations, some of which included a wedding dress and high heels. It is this inclusivity, spontaneity, and energy that made the Good Chance Dome the space that it was. And it doesn't just have a place in the camp. As we proved with encampment at the South Bank Centre, this learning and practice can be taken outside these spaces and moulded to different environments with a similar effect. However, this is not to the credit of the Good Chance team, but because of every single resident of the camp who came through the doors and lit up the space with their individuality, enthusiasm, and creativity. If there is one challenge I would put out there, I'd say be led by your beneficiaries and watch what happens by succumbing to the chaos that follows. Something truly unique and useful can take place. Thanks very much.